Hey everyone, this is Professor Ellis. I want to welcome you to week 8 of Science Fiction English 2420 in Spring 2021. Um, you know, just something to keep in the back of your minds is that we're already halfway through the semester, which I think is a great milestone for us all to celebrate. Uh, that you guys have been doing good work uh, and that I'm looking forward to continuing to see the work that you do, particularly as we move toward the end of the semester uh, with your last set of notebooks, with your research essay, uh, in your weekly writing assignments. Uh, but there are some things that we need to talk about with those weekly writing assignments. So let's take a look at what we need to get done today. Um, first off, we'll look at the syllabus in just a second. Uh, but one of the most important things I wanted to ask everyone to do is make sure as far as your notebooks are concerned and your weekly writing assignments. Um, one of the things that I've seen a number of students may be stumbling a little bit on with the weekly writing assignments uh, concerns spelling of names and correct dates uh, for like say when a, a magazine gets published or when a book gets published that I might mention uh, during lecture. And as I've said before, what I'm grading these on is best effort. But we're at a point now in the semester that your best effort needs to be stronger than the way it was at the beginning of the semester. And so one of the easiest ways uh, in order to pick up your game at this point is to make sure that you're showing due respect to those writers, to those authors, to those editors by making sure that you have their names spelled correctly, uh, whether by reviewing the, the lecture uh, or also, as I've mentioned before, there's no reason that you can't look up any of the things that we talk about uh, on Wikipedia, on the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction website that I've shown you before, um, so that you have those things, those bits of information, those facts, in your notes accurately, precisely, and that you can then use those uh, whenever you're writing your weekly writing assignments. And of course, you will need to know those things accurately uh, for the final exam. So um, with that said, let's take a look at the syllabus so we can see where we're at. Uh, so here I am on our open lab site on the syllabus page. And let's go down to week eight. So for today's class, you read Isaac Asimov's Reason and Ray Bradbury's The Fireman, which we'll talk about, uh, and alongside Golden Age Science Fiction. And then for next week, uh, to give you a heads up, um, and again, this is not technically next week. This is going to be two weeks from now because we have spring recess next week. Uh, so between now and April 7th, uh, you have two stories to read. One is Robert Heinlein's All You Zombies, a uh, neat time travel story. And then Tom Godwin's The Cold Equations, uh, which is an example of hard SF that we're going to talk about. Now, in addition to those two readings, there's also a film to watch, Forbidden Planet. Uh, and thankfully, it's something that's available through the Internet Archive, so you don't have to you know, rent it or try to find a copy. I give you a link where you can watch it online uh, or to download, if you like, from the Internet Archive. Um, and we'll be talking about that as well in terms of Golden Age SF. Uh, and it'll be neat to talk about also in terms of um, its source material, uh, which is William Shakespeare's The Tempest. So if you're familiar with that play, or if you're not, maybe look it up on Wikipedia just to kind of get a sense of what it's about, you'll find some interesting parallels uh, between Forbidden Planet and then that um, famous Shakespeare play. So that's what we got coming up. Um, you use your spring re recess wisely. Try to get caught up in all your classes if you've fallen behind. Um, in our class, if you need some extra help, you know, obviously you can email me, uh, jls at citytech.cuny.edu. Uh, and also, as I'll mention at the end of today's lecture, um, this week's office hours I've had to cancel because I have another meeting come up uh, that I can't miss during our normal office hours time. Uh, so this week I can meet with anybody uh, but we'll need to make an appointment. And as I've said before, all you need to do is let me know what your availability is over a span of a few days, and then we'll try to coordinate our schedules based on that. Um, that it's not a problem to do that. It's something I you know, try to do every semester with my students, um, but it's something that you need to reach out to me if you do want to talk, because in any way, shape, or form that I can help you be successful in our class, 
Uh, that's one of the things that we can use email for, that we can use office hours for, and these appointments for. So that's what we got coming up. Um, and so why don't we go ahead and then look at what we got left today, which is going to be to have the Golden Age of SF lecture part one, and then we'll pick up the rest of it after we come back from spring recess. I'll give you a reminder on the research essay at the end of today's class, and then we'll talk about the homework, which is going to involve some readings, that one viewing, and your weekly writing assignment. So let's recap um, our previous classes before getting st uh, started on um, Golden Age SF. So we began the semester with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein from 1818, uh, the first work that we can confidently say in retrospect is science fiction. Then we learned about proto-SF of the 19th century with Edgar Allan Poe, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and Jules Verne. And then we looked at scientific romances of H.G. Wells in the late 1800s and early uh, 20th century. And of course, the we looked at the critical response to Wells and E.M. Forster's uh, The Machine Stops from 1909. Then last week we discussed pulp SF and the origins of the term science fiction in the pages of Hugo Gernsback's April 1926 Amazing Stories. Make sure you remember the title of that magazine, Amazing Stories, and that its first issue was April 1926. Um, and Gernsback called it science fiction. That was the term that he invented uh, that later uh, you know, transformed uh, into science fiction. But that one word, science fiction, S-C-I-E-N-T-I-F-I-C-T-I-O-N, science fiction. And we read some examples of science fiction, uh, such as E. Doc Smith and Lee Hawkins Garvey's The Skylark of Space, Part 1. And we also looked at C.L. Moore's Chamblo. Uh, from the pages of um, Weird Tales uh, before discussing other pulp SF writers including Edgar Rice Burroughs and H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, then finally, uh, we talked about Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, and SF film serials um, in our last class. So this week we're turning our attention to the golden age of SF. And if we think back to the pulp SF era, the historical world events that framed it were the First World War. Uh, remember, the First World War took place from July 28, 1914 to November 11, 1918. Then there was also the stock market crash of October 29, 1929, and then the ensuing Great Depression that lasted through the following decade. So these were like your know, world uh, influencing events uh, that obviously also played a role uh, in Pulp SF's development. Now, it is out of the tail end of the Great Depression and the beginnings of World War II that we see the emergence of the Golden Age of SF. And so, as, as in our previous lectures, I want us to go over some of this background historical context. Um, these are things that you've, you probably have heard before from your history classes, uh, but it's good to have this refresher uh, so we can kind of make the connections between what was going on historically when these stories and this uh, era of science fiction was taking place. So let's consider what was going on in the world around uh, the Golden Age. Hitler rises to power in Germany during the 1930s. The Italians, led by Mussolini, invaded Ethiopia. General Franco in Spain, supported by Germany and Italy, launched a civil war, which led to him becoming dictator there. Japan invaded China in 1937. Hitler invaded Poland on 1st September 1939, which led to a cascade of declarations of war on Germany. Trying to stay out of what was uh, seen as a largely European war, uh, after our own heavy losses during World War I, and just, just as an example, you, if you, you're not familiar with some of these war memorials, if you go into the downtown Brooklyn post office, just turn to your right against that marble wall, uh, and there's this huge 
uh, bronze plaque on the wall memorializing those from Brooklyn that died in the war. Um, so you know, the United States didn't want to get involved um, because you know, we didn't want to see our soldiers die in something that, at least at the time, we didn't think that we should be involved in. Um, but then, uh, on 7th December 1941, called a date which will live in infamy, infamy by then-President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, the Japanese launched a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, and uh, you know, that swiftly got us involved uh, in what, at that point, had become World War II. Um, following uh, the, the progression of the war, um, Victory in Europe, or VE Day, was on 8th May 1944. Uh, then, in secret, the United States detonated the world's first nuclear weapon at the so-called Trinity Test in the New Mexico desert on July 15th, 1945. Having proven the science and technology behind this unimaginably destructive weapon, then President Truman authorized the dropping of the Little Man atomic bomb a simple gun-type design on the Japanese city of Hiroshima on 6th August 1945. And then the Fat Man atomic bomb, an implosion-type design that was similar to what was detonated at the Trinity test, uh, was dropped on Nagasaki, Japan on 9th August 1944. With these two bombs, between 129,000 and 226,000 people died. Some uh, instantly in the initial blast, some burned to death during the ensuing firestorms, and others were ravaged in the days and weeks that followed due to radioactive fallout. World War II um, introduced the world not only to these new destructive powers, but also to the staggering loss of life. Up to 85 million lives lost during the war. Uh, and of course within that number is Nazi Germany's evil contribution with the systematized genocide of six million European Jews known as the Holocaust. And in addition to these lives lost, Germany also targeted and killed millions of other civilians, including the disabled, political prisoners, homosexuals, black Germans, and others. So the atomic bomb, which is like the big overshadowing um, effect of science and technology uh, from the war, heralded the new atomic age, which combined an optimism for cheap and plentiful nuclear power with pessimism about nuclear proliferation, meaning once the cat was out of the bag, other countries began developing their own nuclear weapons, which could be used against us or our allies or you know, any other country in the world. Uh, the end of World War II also signaled the beginning of the Cold War. While the United States and Britain allied uh, with Soviet Russia during the war to defeat Nazi Germany, after the war, the Western Eastern Alliance quickly withered. The long Cold War between the democratic Western nations and the communist Soviet Union began. NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, was inaugurated in 1949 by the West as a deterrent to perceptions about Soviet Russia's ambitions in the world. Meanwhile, in China, the communists and democratic Kuomintang KMT government, who had paused their civil war to create an alliance against the Japanese during World War II, resumed their fighting which led to the KMT-led government fleeing to the island of Taiwan and the mainland becoming the People's Republic of China. Following World War II, Korea had been divided at the 38th parallel with Russia administering the North and the United States administering the South. Supplied by Russia and China, North Korea invaded South Korea, which began the Korean War in 1950, which ended in 1953. If you've seen the TV show MASH, uh, it takes place during the Korean War. So science innovation, technological advancements, and cultural change also continued during this era. Importantly, mass communication is on the rise with FM radio, television, magazine, and comic book publishing proliferation. 
our attention is being pulled into many different directions by these different media. The transition from radio to television as the primary entertainment medium in the household began. But don't count out the radio for music. Radio and records had become the de facto media for enjoying music. During the 1930s and 1940s, music was dominated by the big bands led by Jimmy Dorsey and Glenn Miller, and crooners like Bing Crosby, Frank Sinatra, and Nat King Cole. Jazz was popularized by talent, including Ella Fitzgerald, Billie Holiday, and Louis Armstrong. Country music was on the rise, with mus musicians including Hank Williams, Eddie Arnold, and the Carter family. And then, rock and roll created a new sound by borrowing and transforming existing genres in the 1940s and 1950s. In addition to the development of atomic weapons during this era, it also saw the introduction of analog and digital computers, jet engines, liquid-propelled rockets, the electron microscope, radar, nylon, the Polaroid instant camera, the electric guitar, the ballpoint pen, penicillin, and the transistor. Uh, some notable things uh, that play a big part in some of the stories that you read, uh, Alan Turing, um, the British mathematician, uh, helped crack the German Enigma cipher messaging machine, which led to Allied superiority in the Atlantic theater of World War II. Before the war, Turing had established a mathematical model for computation, now known as a Turing complete machine, and afterwards created what was what has become known as the Turing test for artificial intelligence. Uh, some other uh, important you know, scientific developments during the time that, play, that plays a big role in science fiction. Robert Oppenheimer, uh, considered you know, the father of the atomic bomb um, because he oversaw the building of the atomic bombs at Los Alamos, had earlier predicted two stellar objects, neutron stars with George Volkoff and black holes with Hartland Snyder. And then also the space race was just around the corner uh, from this era beginning in the 1950s. Also interestingly, Electro, spelled E-L-E-K-T-R-O, a humanoid robot, was on display to the vast crowds who visited the 1939 New York World's Fair. Uh, Electro could walk on command, talk, move its head and legs, blow up a balloon, and even smoke. Electro was only one part of the world of tomorrow presented at the 1939 New York World's Fair at the Flushing Meadows Corona Park um, that you know, was created for the event and then was used again uh, for the 1964 New York World's Fair. Uh, that's when the Unisphere, that big globe that's so recognizable there, was added to the park. So again, why do we look at this historical context? Remember from previous lectures that I said that SF isn't about the future. Instead, it's always about the time in which it was written or created. The reason for this is that to extrapolate an imagined world, future, outer space, whatever, you have to begin from the extrapolation uh, point, its beginning, what is known. Any writer, director, musician, artist, etc. is a product of their time and culture. That's the starting point for any extrapolation. That includes their experiences, their beliefs, their attitudes, and their culture. Therefore, we need to know the historical and cultural context of these writers to better understand their work. Now, this isn't to say that science fiction isn't capable of imagining possible futures. So, this brings us to the Golden Age of SF. Uh, the Golden Age of SF is a significant era of the genre's development around the mid-20th century uh, that begins with John W. Campbell, Jr. changing the name of Astounding Stories to Astounding Science Fiction in 1938 to just about after World War II in 1946 when the general public began to recognize how science fictional the world had become following the dropping of the atomic bombs on Japan in 1945. During that short time, a new legion of young writers pushed the genre forward with new scientifically grounded ideas that framed SF in the decades that followed. Uh, some see the Golden Age extending into the 1950s as these young writers' careers take off, and a new slate of writers 
uh, built on the Golden Age before the field shifted again in the 1960s, as we'll discuss in a few weeks. Now, the Golden Age is, um, you know, an important part of it is a shift from pulp magazines, those coarse, um, very acidic paper, cheap publishing, um, to what are called slicks, which are higher quality magazines. Uh, they, the pages are thinner. Uh, the quality, just the feel of it, uh, uh, is it feels something that's you know more expensive. It's not something as cheap feeling as a pulp magazine. And of course, you know, in some cases these can last longer than the pulps, uh, but for a variety of reasons, uh, the way that they're produced, uh, they can also uh, have some of the same problems in terms of aging, uh, brittleness, etc., that the pulps uh, experience. So they still have to be handled with care today, those that still exist. And of course, at City Tech, um, you know, one of the things I'll talk about you know, later on in the semester is the City Tech Science Fiction Collection, where we have um, a majority of these magazines that were produced during that time, from, you know, beginning with the pulp era through uh, the contemporary science fiction era. Um, and even though we can't go there right now because you know, campus is closed uh, and we're all working remotely, um, one of the things that maybe we can do later on is I can reach back out to you all to let you know when there's going to be special events where we give tours of the collection and also to brainstorm how you might use some of the materials in the collection for projects maybe in other classes where some of you are you know, wanting to get some honors credit. So returning back to Golden Age SF, um, during this era, magazines were far more important than book publishing. Um, and they were also mostly written by men for young male readers. Nevertheless, there is a lot of evidence throughout the publishing history of SF of female readers uh, from letters to the editor and their participation in fandom. And of course, there's also uh, women who are writing SF. Um, you know, sometimes overtly, like C.L. Moore, uh, but then others who um, are using pseudonyms or other ways um, to be able to publish, you know, in a male-dominated field uh, without, like, being judged in some way because of the fact that they are women and you're publishing in this field. Now there's some primary characteristics of the Golden Age SF that I want you to get in your notes. And again, make sure you have your notebooks out. Um, you can be using the Cornell method or any other method that you like, but remember these need to be handwritten notes um, and you'll be scanning them and turning them in at the end of the semester for your notebooks from the midterm until uh, the end of the semester uh, for that big chunk of your grade. You want to remember to do that. So these primary characteristics is something that I definitely want you guys to remember about the Golden Age. And first off, there's a focus on the so-called hard sciences, meaning physics, chemistry, biology, and mathematics. There's not an emphasis on the social sciences, you know, like psychology or sociology. Uh, that's something that'll come later. Second characteristic is that overall there's better writing uh, used um, by the authors during this era as compared to the pulps. Better writing. Uh, third characteristic is that the Golden Age is primarily an American phenomenon. That th this was something that was born out of um, the science fiction writing uh, taking place in the United States. And then the fourth characteristic is that it was centered around the first phase of John W. Campbell Jr.'s editorship of Astounding, centered around the first phase of John W. Campbell Jr.'s editorship of Astounding. So who is this Campbell guy? So make sure you get in your notes, uh, John W. Campbell Jr. And make sure you make a note that he was born in 1910 and he died in 1971. Born in 1910 and died in 1971. So John W. Campbell Jr. was an SF writer and editor. Um, one of the works that you might be familiar with of his, uh, even though you may not have had a chance to read it, 
uh, is who goes there. Um, and this is a story that's, that was later turned into The Thing from Another World. Uh, then it was made into The Thing um, in the 1980s. Uh, and I think there was even another um, um, adaptation of it uh, just some a few years ago. Uh, so a story that he wrote a long time ago is in your head, uh, pretty good legs. You know, it, it keeps getting remade uh, in film media um, as a retelling of that story that he originally had published in the science fiction magazines. So he began his studies at MIT uh, where he met Norbert uh, Viner, uh, who is you know, one of the proponents and you know, one of the, the most important figures at that time in the founding of the science of cybernetics. Uh, and that's spelled C-Y-B-E-R-N-E-T-I-C-S, cybernetics. Um, this is the science of feedback systems. Uh, if you imagine the human body, there's a lot of feedback systems that our body is able to self-regulate. You think of our blood pressure or our insulin levels, our hormonal levels. These are things that our body is able to regulate uh, automatically. Uh, but you imagine how we can apply these feedback systems to technology such as the governor uh, on a gasoline engine, uh, something that when the RPMs get too high, the governor you know, brings the throttle back down automatically. It doesn't have to be human intervention uh, to keep the RPMs at the desired level. So he met Norbert Weiner there, uh, but he transferred to Duke University to complete his Bachelor of Science in Physics uh, and then graduated in 1932. While at university, Campbell began writing SF. Uh, later, he was offered the editorship of Astounding Stories in September 1937, and his first issue as editor appeared in October 1937. Now, importantly, in 1938, Campbell renamed Astounding to Astounding Science-Fiction. Astounding Science-Fiction. And in 1960, uh, just looking ahead, Astounding Science Fiction was renamed Analog Science Fiction and Fact. Analog Science Fiction and Fact, a name that it continues to hold to this day. Uh, and just as another aside, City Tech recently celebrated with Analog uh, their 90th anniversary um, at the annual um, City Tech Science Fiction Symposium that we hold. And we partnered with them that year. Uh, they brought some of the past editors, writers, to City Tech's campus. This was you know, obviously before the um, pandemic, uh, but we hope to continue uh, this relationship with Astounding uh, in the years ahead. Now, returning to John W. Campbell Jr., uh, he thought and wrote about how to elevate science fiction from the pulps. He wanted to make it more respectable. And also, he was an idea guy. He presented writers with ideas, which the writers would then turn into stories. Uh, he worked with writers to develop their stories, in some cases, writing a letter of suggestions to the, the, the science fiction writer that was longer than the story itself. For example, Asimov, who we're going to talk about in a minute, credits Campbell for co-creating uh, the three laws of robotics would um, be impossible to access fully the extent of Campbell's influence on writers during that period, but it is safe to say that he molded the genre into its modern form through his mentoring, editorials, and guidance. Now, John W. Campbell Jr. had a stable of writers, meaning like a group of writers that he regularly worked with. And these writers are the ones that form uh, like the core of Golden Age SF. Now you don't have to write all these down, uh, but I, you might recognize some of the names uh, and you might want to look up some of them uh, on the Cyclopedia of Science Fiction's website. Um, like we're going to talk about today Isaac Asimov. Uh, Lester Del Rey, R-E-Y, Robert Heinlein, Theodore Sturgeon, A.E. Van Vogt, L. Sprague de Camp, L. Ron Hubbard, who you might have heard of before, uh, Clifford D. Simak, 
Jack Williamson, and you know, kind of a crossover team from the pulp SF era to the golden age would be you know this team that we talked about before, C. L. Moore and her husband Henry Cutner. So they were writing both in the pulp era and in the golden age era, and that's true for a number of um, pulp SF writers, uh, but. C.L. Moore and Henry Cutner in particular were writers that regularly worked with John W. Campbell Jr. Now, Astounding dominated under Campbell's editorship, but there were other voices that entered science fiction in 1949 with the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, and then in 1950 with galaxy science fiction. Now, even though I uh, John W. Campbell Jr. was primarily interested in the hard sciences. He flirted with pseudoscientific ideas, including L. Ron Hubbard's Dianetics, which later became Scientology. Uh, and it's important to note that Dianetics began as an article uh, in the May 1950 issue of Astounding Science Fiction. Now, I also don't want to be an apologist for John W. Campbell Jr. or say like you know, he was just the most terrific guy ever uh, because while he made a tremendous impact on the development of science fiction during the Golden Age, uh, he also had some you know, terribly garbage racist ideas um, and he also had some garbage ideas about peaceful protesters in Vietnam. Um, I read an editorial um, uh, from one of his issues uh, in which he calls out those that were shot at Kent State protesting the Vietnam War uh, as, as essentially saying that they got what they deserved. So there was a lot of, you know, we could say deficits about his character. Um, but nevertheless, he, it's undeniable that he had a great impact on the development of science fiction during this time. Now, Campbell edited Astounding until his death in 1971. I mean, he really worked up until the end. He died with his boots on uh, as editor of the magazine. Now, what I'd like you to get into your notes in particular about Campbell uh, is his rules for good science fiction. There's four rules. One, the conditions of the story must differ from the here and now. The conditions of the story must differ from the here and now, meaning the present. Two, the new conditions must drive the plot of the story. So whatever those new conditions are that are different from our present time have to be what drive the story. They can't just be incidental or background stuff. Three, the plot must revolve around human problems arising from the new conditions. So everything, even though you know, we think of science fiction as being centered on science and technology, if it doesn't involve people, really, what, you know, why do we care about it? And so for him, uh, it needs to revolve around human problems that arise from these new conditions uh, presented in the story. And then four, no scientific facts may be violated without reasonable explanation. So certainly there are limits to what we know about science. Uh, and as well as our technological development. Um, but as long as there is some rational explanation given for violations of that or extrapolations of what that may be like in the future, then they would be allowable under his rules for good SF. Now, turning away from John W. Campbell Jr., here's a little bit of background on the big three, the big three science fiction magazines during the Golden Age. So we've already talked about Astounding Science Fiction, now titled Analog Science Fiction and Fact. Uh, it began publishing in 1930 and is still publishing today. The inaugural editor was Harry Bates and this is something I think that's useful to know besides like when they began publishing in 1930 is their focus is on science and technology. And this is one of the things that you find the more that you look at the different magazines publishing science fiction historically is that each magazine kind of needs to carve out its niche 
uh, its market uh, in terms of science fiction. Uh, because if you're publishing the same thing as all the other magazines, um, what is really the incentive for someone to choose your magazine over another one? And so they um, were able to diversify in different ways by focusing on particular types of stories to distinguish themselves amongst a field of different science fiction magazines. The second of the big three is galaxy science fiction. Uh, it, be, it, well, it doesn't it isn't published today, but it ran from 1950 to 1980. And its inaugural editor was was H.L. Gold. And its focus in Galaxy uh, included social issues, psychology, sociology, and satire and humor. So if we want to think of you know, these you know, three big magazines, Galaxy was one that was much more focused on humanistic issues. Um, than the other magazines were to some extent. And I think that's kind of reflected in the second story that we read for today's class by Ray Bradbury, The Fireman, which primarily concerns social issues, uh, not necessarily uh, what we might normally think of in science fiction in terms of robots, spaceships, aliens, etc. And then the third of the big three uh, is the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, or uh, F and SF is how we abbreviate it, F and SF. And they began publishing in 1949 and they continue to publish to this day. Uh, it had two inaugural editors, Anthony Butcher and J. Francis McComas. And their focus was literary SF, like the writing had to be good. Um, and so it involved a lot of different kinds of stories, but all the writing that it uh, published was some of the best writing uh, that came out during this era. Now this brings us to uh, our first uh, reading for today and its writer, Isaac Asimov. Uh, make sure that you spell you know, his name correctly in your notes, I-S-A-A-C, Asimov, A-S-I-M-O-V. And he was born in 1920 and he died in 1992. And so let me give you a little bit of background about him. Uh, so he lived most of his life in New York City uh, or along the East Coast. Like he did have uh, spend a number of years in Boston uh, before moving back. Uh, you should know that he brought more science to science fiction. Unlike Gernsback, who saw the end products of science as technology, Asimov saw science as a means to puzzle out human dilemmas. To use reason and experimentation combined with science and technology to solve human problems is what Isaac Asimov's stories are all about. Now, he was born in Russia, uh, but his family immigrated to the United States when he was three years old. And they immigrated here to Brooklyn. Uh, and his father owned a candy store. Uh, and if you can imagine, uh, you know, Asimov's father would tell little Isaac not to read the science fiction that was, you know, for sale alongside the candy. But Asimov was attracted to the magazine's lurid and colorful covers. Um, over the years, his, father, his father's business grew, and they moved around here in Brooklyn. Uh, but I'll show you here uh, that I mapped out some of the locations where they lived and where their, their stores were. Um, not only where, what it looks like today, but also uh, what it looked like back in time. And so I'll pop this link into uh, today's lecture post on our Open Lab site. Uh, but it goes to this post that I made on my blog, dynamicsofspace.net, called Notes on a Science Fiction Walking Tour in New York City. And so if you scroll down, there's a section I wrote for Isaac Asimov. And you can see these places, uh, his, his family's first apartment, and you can see what it looked like in 1940 by clicking this link. And then you can see what it looks like today by clicking this Google Street View link. Uh, their second apartment on Miller Avenue, you can see what it looked like in the past and then what it looks like today. Uh, their third apartment, um, 
on Essex Street. Uh, you can see what it looked like in the past, but unfortunately, uh, it's you know now a fence line has been torn down. Uh, and then their fifth apartment I was able to locate. Uh, here is a tax photo, and here's what it looks like on Google Street View. So some of these buildings still exist, though obviously there's something different today. Um, but to take that step back in time, I think is um, you know both interesting, um, but also you know, sh being able to see how this history of science fiction uh, is rooted right here in our city, in New York City. Now, Isaac Asimov was a member of one of the most important fandom groups in the early development of the genre, the Futurians, F-U-T-U-R-I-A-N-S. This influential group, the Futurians, was active from 1938 to 1945. So, I mean, like right there in the heart of um, the Golden Age, and they were based right here in New York. Many of its members went on to become successful SF writers. So, I mean, they began as fans that turned into some of the great science fiction writers of that time, including Isaac Asimov, James Blish, C.M. Kornbluth, Frederick Pohl, and Donald Wolheim. So some very big names came out of the Futurian uh, fandom group. Now, unlike many SF writers, Asimov was a trained scientist. He held a PhD in biochemistry from Columbia University. Uh, the subject that he researched and taught at Boston University School of Medicine until 1958. So that was when he was out living outside the city. Now, this is something that you should really pay attention to. I mean, you don't have to get all of these details in your notes, but I mean, this tells you a lot about the person, these kinds of little details that I'm giving you. While Asimov wrote or edited over 500 books during his lifetime, I mean, just let that sink in. I mean, that, that's a milestone that I can't imagine anyone ever having passed before. Um, the thing about all those books is that they were not all SF. They included textbooks, anthologies, histories, studies of the Bible, studies on Shakespeare, limerick collections, uh, detective fiction, science popularizations. A science popularization is a book about a scientific topic that's written for you know, a general audience. It doesn't have to be someone that knows calculus, for example, in order to understand. So I think with that context, this thing that Harlan Ellison, a science fiction writer we're going to be talking about in a few weeks, said about Asimov will make a little bit of sense. Harlan Ellison once said that Asimov had writer's block. It was the worst 10 minutes of his life. I mean, the thing about Asimov is there wasn't a moment he wasn't writing because in addition to all of this book writing and story writing that he did, editing work that he did, he was also a pl um, prolific writer of letters and postcards. He would correspond with fans when they would write him. Uh, and so he would always be sending things back out. And so, I mean, you imagine that from sunup to sundown, he was writing, you know, more than likely at his typewriter until later in life when he got a computer uh, where he was doing that kind of writing. Now, Asimov lent his name to one of the few remaining science fiction magazines still published today. Um, and he, he did that in the year that I was born, 1977. And that magazine is called Isaac Asimov Science Fiction Magazine. Uh, now it's just simply Asimov Science Fiction. Um, now this is you know some of the you know tragic stuff about his life also happened that year. He had suffered a massive heart attack in '77, and then later he had a triple bypass operation in 1983. Um, his doctors later suspected that he contracted HIV from a blood transfusion given during that triple bypass surgery. Um, his family kept this revelation quiet due to the prejudice surrounding the illness, um, which was at its height in the 1980s and the early 1990s. And he died in 1992 from AIDS-related complications.
So let's talk a little bit about Asimov's oeuvre. Uh, this is this word oeuvre, O-E-U-V-R-E, -E, uh, means the all the different work that a person has written. Uh, so we could talk about Shakespeare's oeuvre. Uh, in this case, we're talking about Asimov's oeuvre. That's the breadth of all of his work. Uh, and so I want to talk about uh, some of these and some of the details in these stories that have been influential beyond just science fiction. Um, so first off are these robot stories. Uh, and in these robot stories they began in 1940 with a story uh, that was then titled Strange Playfellow. And later it got changed to Robbie after the name of the robot in the story. Now, what's interesting is like in that early story, there's, there's obviously a robot, um, but there's no reference of the word used to describe the science of robots, robotics, until Isaac Asimov invented it. He coined that term uh, in the May 1941 uh, story, Liar! Exclamation uh, mark, which contains the first use of the word robotics. But now the word robot which you definitely should put in your notes because this is what's going to win you double jeopardy one day. The word robot comes to us from Carol Capex, uh, C-A-P-E-K, Capex, 1920 play, R-U-R, uh, which stands for Rossum's, R-O-S-S-U-M, Rossum's Universal Robots. Uh, and this is from the Czech word for surf worker or drudgery or labor. Now throughout these stories uh, there's an idea that robots are meant to work alongside humankind. That they are not a threat to humanity. Um, that there's something about the way they're constructed that makes them obedient to human beings. And it was a little bit later in the robot stories uh, specifically in the story Runaround from March 1942 that Asimov um, articulated the three laws of robotics. And what's interesting about these three laws is that now many roboticists uh, in terms of like you know, studying the ethics of artificial intelligence, also thinking about how to make robots that are safe for human beings to exist with, um, the three laws of robotics, while I wouldn't say are the definitive answer to this, this problem, they're certainly an inspiration uh, to real-world roboticists and artificial intelligence researchers. So the three laws are, first, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. So they have to protect human beings. The second law is a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. So here we have that robots have to listen to human beings except where that those orders might conflict with the first law. So like I can't tell a robot go kill that person because that will conflict with the first law. And then the third law a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. So with the third law, now we have self-preservation. The robot has to protect itself. But there may be a situation where a robot is ordered uh, to sacrifice itself if it's meant to uh, save a human being. Or the robot may have to act on its own to save a human being knowing full well that it will destroy or hurt itself. So it makes robots, uh, as Asimov um, included in one of the stories, um, you can't really distinguish whether the robot uh, is you know, just simply a robot or if it's a really good human being in terms of its behavior. Now, um, later in life, Asimov fixed up uh, his entire robot 
Empire and Foundation series into a unified series of stories and novels. As part of this fix-up, he added a zeroth law of robotics in the novel Robots and Empire. Uh, and this goes, a robot may not harm humanity or through inaction allow humanity to come to harm. And so essentially the robots in the, this, this new law that gets invented uh, is a way of having robots serve as the, as the stewards of humanity to protect us over our very long history that he details in these novels. Now, before you had this idea of this fix-up, uh, a fix-up is uh, this idea where you go back and find a way to thread what are seemingly separate stories into a unified narrative. Uh, and a lot of writers from this time in the Golden Age uh, would do this uh, because magazine publishing was primary, book publishing was secondary. So you wanted to publish as much as you could in the magazines because that's where you would make your money. But then once book publishing became more profitable, they would take those stories they had written in the magazines and then find ways of linking them together by revising them uh, so that you could create whole novels out of a selection of different short stories. Um, and in fact, um, Asimov did this with the first robot novel, I, Robot, uh, which is essentially um, a fix-up novel that takes different robot stories and threads them together um, essentially as a series of interviews with Susan Calvin who was a robo-psychologist uh, in the robot story world. Um, she's being interviewed by a reporter uh, about her you know, looking back on her life essentially. And so she's telling the stories as recollections. Now, in 1942, Asimov published Foundation, and this later became part of his fix-up with the Robot and Empire novels. But what's neat about Foundation is that it is a story about using science and technology to solve social problems. In Foundation, uh, there's a mathematician named Harry Seldon, H-A-R-I, Seldon, S-E-L-D-O-N, who theorizes a mathematical system that can predict future social movements, and he calls it psychohistory. Through this new science, the future can be predicted, anticipated, and of course, altered. And this sets the template for other future history stories involving a galactic empire, which other writers began to emulate. And then this last story that's on the slide right now I wanted to mention is called Nightfall. This is a very widely anthologized story, very popular, from 1941. And this is a story uh, that looks at the effects of the natural world on human society. And so John W. Campbell Jr. gave Asimov this quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson's 1936 essay, Nature. Quote, if the star should appear one night in a thousand years, how would men believe and adore and preserve for many generations the remembrance of the city of God? End quote. Uh, Campbell uh, disagreed, uh, thinking that people would just simply go crazy. And so Asimov came up with a story about a six-star system with the fictional planet called Lagash. One night, about every 2,000 years, the inhabited parts of the planet fall into darkness. In the dark, seeing the billions and billions of stars beyond drives the population crazy. First realization that there is more to the universe than their planet and their immediate six-star system. Uh, this is one of the most anthologized and recognized SF stories outside of genre readers. And so this brings us to today's reading, uh, Reason. And so let's see where we got it here. There we go. 
So the story that you read for today's class, Reason, uh, make sure you put it into quotation marks because it's a short, you know, it's a short story. Uh, it's not a big work, so we put it in quotation marks. Big works like books we want to italicize. So Reason was published in this issue, April 1941 issue of Astounding Science Fiction. And as I mentioned before, that dash, make sure you get that dash in there for Astounding Science Dash Fiction. 20 cents for a magazine, amazing, isn't it? Uh, it's hard to, hard to imagine a uh, difference in price from then to today. Um, so Reason is one of a number of Powell and Donovan stories within the larger oeuvre of Asimov's extensive collection of robot stories. Powell and Donovan are robot technicians who work for U.S. robots and mechanical men. Their job is to go out into the field, set up robots for specific jobs, and solve problems with robots as they arise. This story concerns a very unusual problem. Aboard Solar Station Number 5, an energy transfer facility that collects solar energy and beams that energy very precisely to receiver stations on the surface of the Earth, Powell and Donovan are at their wit's end with robot QT1, or as they like to call it, QD. QD expresses doubts about how it came to exist. He doesn't believe human beings who he sees as inferior to his robotic construction, could have created him. Powell and Donovan's explanations about the stars, planets, and the need for robots to man the station where radiation is dangerous to humans falls on Cutie's deaf ears as implausible hypotheses. Beginning like the Enlightenment philosopher René Descartes, did centuries ago with cogito ergo sum, or I think, therefore I am, which I mentioned in the very first lecture. Cutie develops his own philosophy of life, a cosmology with the station as the master and Cutie as the master's prophet. Despite all evidence to the contrary from books, to Powell and Donovan building a new robot in front of Cutie, proving that humans you know, built robots. The robot Cutie always rationalized uh, its beliefs in favor of its own philosophy. When Donovan blasphemed the master, Cutie had the other robots confine them to quarters. This happens just as a solar storm is approaching, and Powell and Donovan were unsure if Cutie would follow orders to keep the beam targeted correctly, or if it might let the beam wander, which would destroy vast areas on the Earth. Think of it kind of like a Death Star ray. Uh, it's being used for good if the beam goes to the receiving station correctly. But if it goes elsewhere, all that energy is just being thrown around on the ground, on buildings, on people, etc. So, when the storm passed, Cutie visited Powell and Donovan to give them the readouts as a kind of peace offering. Powell and Donovan realized that the beam held steady, despite Cutie's reasoning for keeping it on target. So, while Cutie's religion might be odd, it didn't keep the robot from doing its job. So this is just one story that is emblematic of, of many of the robot stories, um, but there are other characters that appear, as I mentioned before, like Susan Calvin, the robo-psychologist, uh, figures into a number of them as well. Um, definitely worth checking out. I mean, these are some of the first science fiction stories that I had read when I was younger and um, caused me to fall in love with the genre. So I can't recommend Asimov highly enough. Next, let's turn to our next author in reading, Ray Bradbury. Make sure you put in your notes his name, Ray Bradbury, B-R-A-D-B-U-R-Y, and make sure you note his birth and death dates, 1920 to 2012. 1920 to 2012. 
Ray Bradbury was born in Waukegan, Illinois, but lived in Los Angeles on the West Coast uh, from his teenage years onwards. After high school, he was unable to afford college, so he went to the local library where he read every single book there and he claims to have graduated from the library at age 28. While a little of his work did appear in Campbell's Astounding Science Fiction, the majority of his work appeared elsewhere, uh, from amazing stories to weird tales, and as well as some of the mainstream magazines, which you know was a total coup for science fiction writers, uh, to appear in the Saturday Evening Post, Collier's, and even Playboy magazine. He was the first SF writer to have his work reviewed on the first page of the New York Times book review. He brought science fiction out of its ghetto and into the wider culture. Because if you imagine, at that time, science fiction was looked down on. People didn't respect it as real literature. And so Bradbury was able to elevate it, to bring it out of that view to a number of people by showing what you could do with it, uh, not only in terms of the ideas, but with the artistry that he employs in his writing and the richness of his writing that he uses to connect it to culture at large, which we're going to talk about today. Now, we can say about his writing that it's poetic, it's symbolic, and it's heavily nostalgic, you know, looking back fondly at a past uh, that's you know, lost. It freely mixes science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Now, there are four repeated themes in his writing that you should put into your notes. First, there is an anti-technological bias an anti-technological bias. Though he supported space travel, he was, he was definitely for space travel, but a lot of technology, like we'll talk about today, were things that he didn't think were necessarily good for humanity. The second theme of Bradbury's work that you should know about is a celebration of simplicity and innocence as imagined in small town life. Celebration of simplicity and innocence as imagined in small town life. A third theme is a sense of loss as youth changes into adulthood. A sense of loss as youth changes into adulthood. And then fourth, danger and attraction of mask danger and attraction of mask. Now the neat thing about this is not literally like you know people wearing masks like Darth Vader or stormtroopers in Star Wars, but you can imagine people you know do wear masks you know in different uh, situations dealing with different people uh, and so that in a sense simply the expression that you use in different situations with different people can serve as a mask. Uh, and I think in different ways we see some of that in the firemen and, and its further development in Fahrenheit 451 uh, with uh, the chief of the firemen, uh, that his face can change uh, in some very grotesque, strange ways. And the same is true for Montag uh, up until like he realizes you know, that what he's doing is wrong. Now, there's some important works in Ray Bradbury's oeuvre that I wanted to mention before we talk about the reading for today, The Fireman. So first uh, is The Martian Chronicles from 1950. And coincidentally, this is also the same year that Isaac Asimov's I, Robot was published, that fix-up novel of his early robot stories. So Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles was inspired by Sherwood Anderson's Winesburg, Ohio from 1919 and John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath from 1939. So Bradbury, the science fiction writer, is being inspired by these important works 
of literary fiction uh, from the United States. Um, with Winesburg, Ohio, you have these uh, themes of uh, small towns, of nostalgia for some idealized past that you know, is eventually fading away as time marches on. And then with the Grapes of Wrath, uh, this idea of like moving into, um, we could say in this sense, a new frontier, hoping for a better life after so many things had gone wrong. In this case, humanity is wanting to leave Earth, which has been you know, decimated by environmental catastrophes and war, uh, for you know, a new start on Mars. So the story of the novel is about humanity colonizing Mars while fleeing the nuclear threat of Earth. Confrontations and decimation of the aboriginal Martians um, is the tragic element of the story. Uh, and then at the end of the novel, there's this return of humanity to a post-apocalyptic Earth. It's like they're yearning for this thing that they've lost, and so they decide to go back, uh, unfortunately, after they've killed off most of the Martians. Uh, which again is mirroring just you know kind of the way Western culture is uh, and has been for a number of centuries. Uh, so Bradbury's playing with all these ideas uh, in this work. Uh, so using this vision of the future as a way uh, both to reflect on where we've been and also to kind of hold a mirror up to ourselves uh, about uh, Western society. Uh, the second word that I wanted to mention is There Will Come Soft Rains from 1950. And this is one of his uh, stories that appeared in a mainstream publication. Uh, it first appears in the May 6, 1950 issue of Collier's. Uh, it's a popular mainstream magazine at the time. And it's a response to the aftermath of the nuclear bomb attacks on Hiroshima in Nagasaki in the beginning of the Cold War. And just want to show you some of the, these things in particular that, I, that played a big role on his thinking here. You might have seen these images before, uh, but this particular photograph is showing what is essentially a captured shadow of a person sitting on these bank steps. This is the steps leading into a bank in Hiroshima uh, after the atomic bomb was dropped. And so the person uh, has, has died, obviously. Um, they are very close to the hypocenter of the blast, 250 meters. I mean, I mean, about as close as you can get without being under it. And you imagine the heat from the blast was so intense that it scorched everything around and this black spot is actually the absence of that heat because the body of the human being who was sitting there that is no longer alive was a shield to those to that heat and the force of the blast and left this mark which still exists till to today they removed these steps and they're now in a museum so you can go and see it for to remember what happened in Hiroshima. Um, but this shadow was something that you know, was very important to Bradbury's thinking about the threat of atomic weapons. Uh, this is the same scene taken from a different angle with a human, you know, a person pointing to the shadow here. These are the steps. So this is in Hiroshima. Then in Nagasaki, this is another example of this phenomenon of a shadow left by someone standing in the way of the blast of the bomb. And this is a, was, there was a ladder here next to this building. And this was a soldier, according to historic records, who was standing next to the ladder. And so they were standing there when the blast went off. And they're further away um, by a couple of thousand meters than that person that was sitting at Sumitomo Bank in Hiroshima. But yet it still burned this image onto the side of the building. And I say burned loosely, 
because again the shadow is the absence of that energy from the blast all this around it was actually the blast hitting the building but where this shadow is was where the blast was lessened by the ladder and by the soldier standing next to it so these things weighed on Bradbury's mind uh, when he was writing this story there will come soft rains definitely should read it if you haven't read it before it's widely anthologized um, but I'll tell you a little bit about it the story presents scenes from an automated home of the future where robots go about cleaning it up and maintaining the home as if nothing's wrong however as the story's viewpoint moves around the home we discover that there are no people anywhere except for their shadows etched onto the outside of the house inside the family dog dies from what might be radiation poisoning and the robots dutifully remove the body and clean up the mess we are gone but our technology continues doing what it was designed to do until it too breaks down Now, the aftermath of World War I would have been something on the mind of the poet who wrote a poem that Bradbury is taking the title of his story from, There Will Come Soft Rains. And that particular poem is by Sarah Teasdale, S-A-R-A-T-E-A-S-D-A-L-E. Uh, and she wrote the original, uh, There Will Come Soft Rains, uh, in 1920. And Bradbury extrapolates the ideas from Teasdale's original poem into this imagined future after an atomic bombing. And so he's, you know, where, whereas someone like Teasdale would probably have been horrified by, like, what happened during World War I and the way that soldiers died uh, by great numbers but then also there were the maimed that came back with lost limbs uh, with ravaged lungs from mustard gas and, and other chemical weapons excuse me so in both cases in Teasdale's and Bradbury's cases there is this concern about new technologies and their effect on human beings the science and technology behind them so let's see, let me, um, bring up this poem. There will come soft rains. And so let's read this together, just to kind of give you a sense of this before we get into the firing. So we're going to look at some of the poems that were in it, because these are things that Bradbury uses explicitly to help us understand the stories that he's writing. He's giving us extra context. Just like I begin the lecture with that historical and cultural context, Bradbury's building this into his stories to help us better understand where he's coming from and what they mean. So, Sarah Teasdale, um, 1884 1933, uh, this is the, story, the poem, There Will Come Soft Rains. Wartime, in parentheses. There will come soft rains and the smell of the ground, and swallows circling with their shimmering sound, and frogs in the pool singing at night, and wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathery fire, whistling their whims on a low fence wire. And not one will know of the war, not one will care at last when it is done. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly. And Spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone. And so you see in this poem, I think, the same sense of absence that nature and the world and the universe would essentially not give a tinker's cuss if we were to disappear after all these terrible things that we've done in war. Uh, and so Bradbury takes that idea and then builds a story, a science fiction story, around that idea 
uh, to where this thing that's left behind essentially is our technology. Um, still going about doing things in the home uh, until eventually it breaks down as well. And then all that's left for that point will be nature. Now, one final story before we get to the fireman uh, is The Illustrated Man. This is one of my favorite uh, novels uh, by Bradbury, 1951. Um, it's a really neat uh, you know, threading together of stories around this idea of an illustrated man, a tattooed man. So the narrator encounters a vagrant who has richly colorful and animated tattoos uh, allegedly penned by a woman from the future. Under the stars, the traveler watches each tattoo unfold a story about the future until, at the end, he races off in horror at seeing the last tale with the narrator dying at the hands of the illustrated man. It combines weird, horror, and science fiction into a single narrative. Uh, and it's done artfully uh, by Bradbury. So then that brings us to Ray Bradbury's uh, The Fireman. And let's see. And again, here's the cover of the issue that you read for today's class. I gave you a link to Galaxy Science Fiction, February 1951. Um, I think it's interesting, you know, to look at this cover. You know, at, for those of you that read the story, you know that has nothing to do with rocket ships. So if you were to put that in your weekly writing assignment, I'm probably going to not consider that being worthy of full credit. Um, but again, you have to think of the covers of these science fiction magazines as being uh, the vehicle for selling it to an audience that doesn't necessarily know what the stories are going to be about uh, in the issue. But if you think science fiction, rocket ships, an alien landscape, uh, figures wearing spacesuits, these are things that will probably sell the magazine better uh, than flamethrow wielding firemen who are burning books. Um, not in all times and places, but at that time during the Golden Age, uh, it would have been something um, that would potential readers probably would have looked a little askew at. So, Ray Bradbury's The Fireman. Uh, this was published in February 1951 uh, in Galaxy Science Fiction. So make sure you get that in your notes. The Fireman should be in quote, quotation marks. You know, it's not a full novel. Um, make sure you get February 1951 and that it was published in Galaxy Science Fiction. You should also know that Bradbury expanded The Fireman into his groundbreaking novel against censorship that you might have read or heard about before called Fahrenheit 451. F-A-H-R-E-N-H-E-I-T, Fahrenheit 451, in 1953. Now, there is some context about the story that you need to know. Elements of the story, such as going for a walk on the sidewalk, uh, was inspired by Bradbury's own run-in with an overzealous police officer in Los Angeles who questioned Bradbury and a friend on a late-night walk. Also, Bradbury was acutely aware of Nazi book burning during World War II, so in the lead-up to World War II and then during it, uh, Nazis in Germany set large bonfires to destroy books written by Jews and books with ideas that they disliked. The Nazis were attempting to destroy whole swaths of their culture in favor of their perverted ideal. It should be noted that the United States is not unfamiliar with book burnings and censorship too. On this point of censorship, you should know that censorship is when one's government prohibits the publishing, sharing, or dissemination of one's words and ideas. Drives by certain individuals and organizations in the United States to censor books and newspapers offended those like Bradbury who believed in our First Amendment right 
to freedom of speech. Alongside these drives for censorship were political witch hunts for communists within the United States. The House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC, H-U-A-C, was formed in 1938, right there at the beginning of the Golden Age, to investigate communism in the United States. In 1947, it led to the blacklisting of some significant Hollywood screenwriters and directors, meaning that they nobody would hire them to do work anymore. The hearings held by HUAC were essentially what we would call a kangaroo court. A kangaroo court is a court that doesn't follow established rule of law or due process to achieve a foregone conclusion. For example, the Nazis People's Court was a kangaroo court used as a political show trial to denounce and then punish those targeted by the Nazis. In the case of the HUAC hearings, those called to Congress to answer questions about their political beliefs were highly irregular and some say illegal because the Constitution guarantees our right to hold whatever political beliefs that we want. It wasn't illegal to be a communist, but these hearings framed being a communist as virtually illegal. Bradbury saw these things as a government turned against his people and running roughshod over its own laws. All of these things figured into Bradbury's thinking when writing an earlier story titled The Pedestrian, which he in turn revised into the fireman story that we read for class and eventually turned into the important novel Fahrenheit 451, which was published in 1953, and a little bit of trivia for when you're on Jeopardy one day, it was also serialized in the March, April, and May 1954 issues of Playboy magazine by Hugh Hefner, who was both a supporter of the First Amendment and a publisher of science fiction on occasion in his men's magazine. Uh, also, just uh, as, a, as some background, Fahrenheit 451 refers to the ignition point of book paper, meaning the point at which book paper will begin to burn. The, fer the fireman and Fahrenheit 451 are about a future in which books are banned and a fireman's duty is to burn books instead of extinguishing fires. Uh, it is about censorship, popular culture run amok, and the sinister problems surrounding TV immersion and surveillance technologies. Think reality TV before reality TV. Uh, another interesting thing uh, to think about with someone like Bradbury, who, you know, when he was starting off, didn't have a lot of money, was having to like, you know, essentially pinch pennies in order to get by. That when he wrote the Fireman, he wrote it on rented typewriters in the UCLA library basement. And if you imagine, before there were computers, right, that if you needed to type something, you needed a typewriter. And so back in the day, libraries, like you know, at City Tech, instead of having computers on desk that you could go and sit at and use, would have rows of typewriters that you could sit at. And these typewriters had little coin um, banks on the side that work a lot like you know, the, the, um, the coin inserts on like a laundry machine at the laundromat. So if you want to get a little bit of time to type something on the typewriter, you would put in a dime, and that would give you 30 minutes of typing time. And after which the typewriter would lock up, you could put in another dime, and you get 30 more minutes to type. So the fireman that you read for today's class cost Bradbury $9.80 in dimes. I'll let you figure out how long that took. Uh, how, how, how much time it took him to type all that out. $9.80 in dimes. 10 cents for 30 minutes. A little math problem for today's class. So, what is the fireman about? Uh, the story follows Montag, a fireman, whose job it is to burn and destroy books. 
in this extrapolated future where there are hints about an ongoing war between the United States and other countries, books and the ideas that they contain are considered too dangerous. Thinking deeply about things which books encourage have been outlawed. If you are caught with books, they are seized and destroyed. Montag suffers a crisis of belief in his work after having stolen some books and peeking at what they contain. A neighborhood girl named Clarice helps Montag challenge the status quo by walking, slowing down, looking around at the world, but then she is run down by an automobile and dies. Montag's wife, Mildred, wants no part of Montag's changing and dangerous worldview. But she's unable to articulate her own ennui. Uh, that's a good word for you all to know. Just put that in your notes. E-N-N-U-I. Ennui. It's kind of like this deep, foreboding sadness uh, without really something you can like point to as being the cause. Her own ennui and overdoses on medications on more than one occasion. Montag's chief, Lee, suspects Montag's personal crisis and offers him a way out. But after Montag tries to engage his wife and her friends with the power of the writing that he has salvaged, they react in horror. On his next shift, there is a call, and the firemen, including Montag, converge on a house. Montag's house. They find and destroy the books, and Chief Lee tells Montag he is under arrest. Using his flamethrower, Montag burns down Lee and knocks out the other firemen and destroys the kerosene-filled fire truck. Grabbing a stack of stashed books, Montag runs to the English professor Faber's home, who told him a way out of the city to find others interested in preserving books. Pursued by an electric hound, think of it like an advanced version of the robots produced today by Boston Dynamics. Montag finds the book people in Granger, um, the former T.S. Eliot chair at Cambridge University. I think I mentioned T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland in an earlier lecture. Uh, so this is the chair um, special endowment at Cambridge University that this person held, so a very prestigious um, professor of English was like kind of the leader of this group of the hobos. To protect, protect the books, these people memorize them and let themselves embody the text. Then the city is destroyed by a nuclear weapon and the book people keep the text alive. Now, there's some significant literature and religious texts that are mentioned, such as Shakespeare, Edgar Allan Poe, the Bible, when he mentions you know, Matthew and Mark, uh, Thomas Jefferson's writings, Abraham Lincoln, and the Book of Job, whose tests to keep the faith might be meant to mirror Montag's own crisis of faith and then his trials while trying to save his stolen books. So again, Bradbury is drawing on this rich knowledge of literature and religion and just our culture in general to inform and make his works that much more detailed and intricate uh, than what we might typically think of as a golden age science fiction story. Um, but we can also learn some important things from the other texts that Bradbury references in The Fireman, and I want us to spend time looking at two of these uh, during today's class. So, for example, uh, there's the poem Mildred reads after Montag shows her his books. So this is when Montag and Mildred are alone in the house. Um, let's see. The particular poem that she reads is called You, Andrew Marvell. And Andrew Marvell is this fellow right here. And so let me give you some background on this and who this is that the poem is referencing. So the poem, You, Andrew Marvell, 
is by Archibald MacLeish. And I will take a look at him and his work in a minute. Um, but Andrew Marvell uh, was well known for these types of poems written. Um, this would be very close to what we talked about earlier with the Enlightenment. Um, is that Andrew Marvell was an English writer and politician who lived from 1621 to 1678. So like just, just before like uh, the Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution really kicked off. And the kinds of poems that Andrew Marvell was particularly known for and that were popular at that time were called Carpe Diem. Carpe Diem is Latin for seize the day. Um, and the particular poem that Andrew Marvell is probably most well known for is To His Coy Mistress. It's a carpe diem style poem. And you might remember the phrase carpe diem from Robin Williams' uh, film Dead Poet Society, which is like a big theme uh, of, of you know, what his character is trying to instill in his pupils, his students. So Marvell's poem is titled, To His Coy Mistress. In the poem, the speaker entreats a beautiful woman to love him back because time is fleeting and life is short. Uh, it begins, had we but world enough and time, this coyness lady were no crime. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. So it's all about, you know, like, let's take advantage of the here and now um, because we need to seize the day, take advantage of what we have today because we don't know what's going to come tomorrow. Now, Bradbury doesn't use Marvell's poem. Instead, he's referencing and including a quote from Archibald MacLeish's You, Andrew Marvell, which by its structure and references uh, tonight is closely connected to Andrew Marvell's To His Coy Mistress. So here's Archibald McLeish. And this website that I'm showing you here, if you're interested in these and want to learn more, this is a great website for exploring poetry. Uh, it's poetryfoundation.org. Not only does it have a lot of free poems uh, that you can read, uh, but it gives you detailed uh, biographies of the poets. So Archibald MacLeish was a writer and lawyer from Illinois, like Bradbury. MacLeish imagined that World War I marked the passing from an old world to a new world, one that is quote-unquote sensed rather than understood. Perhaps Bradbury, writing after World War II and the advent of the atomic bomb, is signaling to us that once again the old world is gone and we are entering a new world besieged by new threats, including the atomic bomb, as well as a new type of culture that we might call distraction culture. and we're dealing with an overzealous government. So this is the new world that, that Bradbury is concerned about. Now, what I think is important for us to consider is how this poem, You, Andrew Marvell, that appears in The Fireman, um, how this poem's attention to places, sharing time, all eventually lead to uh, the passage uh, at the end, how swift, how secretly, the shadow of the night comes on. The world of the fireman is coming to a close. A passage of an old world into a new world for the hobos, the holders of books and knowledge. The living books who carry human culture and knowledge forward after the atomic bombs have destroyed the cities. And so what I'm talking about here, and we can read through this, is how McLeish is looking at these different places, and he's relating all that to 
uh, this end where the shadow of night comes on. It's something that the, the night falls everywhere, right? I mean, it's something both obvious, but it's also something that he's pointing out for some reason. And I think it points to this transition. So let's read through this. You, Andrew Marvell. And again, that, there's that excerpt of it in The Fireman, which is why I think it's important for us to look at this um, in our thinking about uh, Bradbury's writing. You, comma, Andrew Marvell. And here, face down beneath the sun, and here upon earth's noonward height, to feel the always coming on, the always rising of the night. To feel creep up the curving east, the earthly chill of dusk and slow upon those underlands the vast and ever climbing shadow grow. And strange at Ecbaton the trees take leaf by leaf the evening strange, the flooding dark about their knees the mountains over Persia change. And now at Kermanshaw the gate, dark empty and the withered grass, and through the twilight now the late few travelers in the westward pass. And Baghdad darken and the bridge across the silent river gone, and through Arabia the edge of evening widen and steal on. And deepen in Palmyra's street the wheel rut and the ruined stone, and Lebanon fade out and crete high through the clouds and overblown. And over Sicily the air still flashing with the landward gulls, and loom and slowly disappear the sails above the shadowy hulls. And Spain go under, and the shore of Africa the gilded sand, and evening vanish, and no more the low pale light across that land, nor now the long light on the sea. And here face downward in the sun, to feel how swift, how secretly, the shadow of the night comes on. So if we think, you know, on the one hand, this poem itself is looking back at, um, to his coy mistress, as being this, entreaty to seize the day. Here, you, Andrew Marvell, by Archibald MacLeish, is pulling things back, not just reflecting on the day, but also acknowledging that there is going to be a tomorrow, but what that tomorrow might be, we don't necessarily know. Perhaps it is you know, simply trying to make us reflect on tomorrow after the night falls, might not be all that great, which is what Bradbury at first signals with like the atomic bomb destroying the cities. But we also have to acknowledge that the hobos are still living. You know, they just go on, they make their breakfast, they're walking around reciting the, the words that they've memorized of the different stories that they've you know, took into their minds to remember for humanity. So instead of necessarily needing to seize the day because tomorrow might not come, here we're seeing that there is some hope in the future. And perhaps it's that optimism uh, that Bradbury is offering us at the end of The Fireman um, is you know, perhaps a hallmark of a lot of science fiction. Um, but even with you know, Bradbury's pessimism towards certain technologies, there's still some hope about what tomorrow might bring. Now, later in The Fireman, there is the poem that Montag reads to Mildred and her friends. And this is a poem um, by this fellow, Matthew Arnold, um, and the poem is titled Dover Beach. Now, Matthew Arnold was a Victorian writer who called for a modern era grounded in reason, compassion, peace, and you know, you being civil essentially. These qualities are those he realized or not realized idealized about ancient Greece. Perhaps these were qualities to strive for. Yet the poem Dover Beach, first published in 1867, is pessimistic. In part. It laments the loss of Christian faith in favor of science and technology, 
which by turn makes the world a barren place for the speaker in the poem. He idealizes this past sea of faith, but he ignores the horror of the past before the advent of science. Certainly the modern era might, quote, this is from the poem, so new hath really neither joy nor love nor light nor certitude nor peace nor help for pain, uh, end quote. But I would counter that the speaker's nostalgia for the past clouds their views of the present. Nevertheless, it applies importantly to Bradbury's thesis in The Fireman that new technologies like constant sensory bombardment via earbuds and wall screen televisions and medications and high-speed automobiles accelerate ourselves and our attention so that we lose connection with one another and the world around us. All of these distractions keep us from thinking deeply about things. Now, think back to the context that I opened today's lecture with. Excuse me. About the part regarding mass culture, magazines, comic books, popular music, radio and television. Each of these call for our attention. There's only so much time in the day, and it is within that time that we give our attention to different activities with our friends and family, listening to the radio, reading a magazine, etc. With all of this mass culture intruding our attention, Bradbury's concern is that we're not leaving time to think, reflect, look around, or enjoy a good book, which can enrich our thinking and experience of the world and our experience with others. And if we're not paying attention to the world and getting involved in what's taking place, our government will run out of control and the atomic bombs will eventually fall. There's a lesson in there about today's so-called attention economy and social media. It shouldn't be lost on us how folks staring into their smartphone screens while walking, riding the subway or bus, or sitting at home with family, or even looking at their phones when you go out with friends says a lot about our culture and its amplification of the issues Bradbury wrote about with concern in The Fireman. Perhaps the media theorist Sherry Turkle put it best with her book title, Alone Together, Why We Expect More from Technology and Less from Each Other. So that concludes this week's lecture. Uh, I would recommend, if you get a chance, uh, I will include links to these on Open Lab with this week's lecture, but Dover Beach, the whole poem is here, uh, so you can take a look at it and also read about um, Matthew Arnold, who wrote that, because I think that that's an, an important work that Bradbury mentions that helps you unlock kind of what's going on in the story, besides like the obvious stories, like what is the meaning behind it, what uh, is maybe he trying to warn us about. Because while I you say said at the beginning of the lecture that science fiction is always about the here and now in which it was produced, uh, but that doesn't mean that science fiction can't also be a warning, that it can't also present a vision of possibilities. It just means that it's always rooted in the here and now in which it's produced, but then these secondary things about imagining a better future, presenting a vision of things uh, that could be done in order to make the world more equitable, etc., can also be a part of the program. Um, and so this is going to be some of the things that inform our later conversations with some other works that we're going to look at this semester. Um, but I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves yet. So the last things I wanted to mention today is I've heard from the majority of folks in the class about your research essay, but if you're still deciding that, Make sure you email me and I'll email you back as soon as I can with some feedback uh, on what you're wanting to work on. Remember, it can be any book, novel, uh, novella, short story, TV series, film, uh, video game, album, art, anything that is involving some aspect of science fiction. Um, and again, there's a lot of possibilities of what your research question can be. Uh, but in our next lecture, I'll go into more 
uh, detail about finding sources, which I've already gone over a little, but I want to really help you guys see like how research works, that it's not simply about finding a quote and putting it in your essay, that the point of this kind of research essay assignment is to become a part of discourse. Discourse uh, is the conversations that we have about things, the big conversations. And so what you want to do is find out what other people are saying about the work you've selected or something related to the work you selected. Because some of the stuff you, you selected is like very brand new stuff. So you might have to find something tangentially related, maybe a, a similar type of film or TV show or video game. Um, and see what people are saying about it and then you get to respond to that quote that you include in your essay. That is adding to discourse where you become a part of that bigger conversation. That is what's cool about research. Not simply that you're just writing some words about this, this topic you've selected. is that you want to join the conversation that's already taking place around the thing that you've selected. Uh, and just that realization that other people are interested in these things, I think, can be incredibly powerful uh, for you. Like you're gaining knowledge and awareness of science fiction and what it means in the world. Now, looking ahead, um, readings, viewings, and homework. So remember, next week is spring recess. So I won't be seeing you again for two weeks. Um, but the assignments are to read Robert Heinlein's All You Zombies, Time Travel Story, uh, Tom Godwin's The Cold Equations. This is going to be an example of hard science fiction. Uh, also, the viewing of Forbidden Planet, uh, which I gave you a link to uh, on archive.org. Uh, make sure that you get your weekly writing assignment done. You're going to have two weeks to do it because of spring recess. So it's not due until our next class on April 7th. Okay. So that gives you a little breathing room. Um, and the weekly writing assignment, again, 250 words summarizing the highlights from your readings and from this week's lecture. Remember, get the spellings right. Look it up if you're not sure. If you don't want to go back to the lecture and pause it, which you, know, you have the power to do, um, but you can look on Wikipedia, look on the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction, a lot of different resources to make sure you get those names spelled correctly, those dates right. Those are details uh, that you need to know if you want, uh, you're not just pragmatically to get full credit, uh, but also to say that you are becoming an expert on science fiction. Um, so if anybody's got anything else, make sure you remember to email me, jls at citytech.cuny.edu. Remember this week's office hours I had to cancel because I have a you know, conflicting meeting that I have to go to. Uh, during our normal time from 3 to 5 on Wednesday. So I'm holding office hours by appointment. Just shoot me an email, let me know when you're available for a few days, and then I'll get back to you uh, about that. Um, and you know, the thing is true even about spring recess. Like if you can't come this week, I'm, you know, I'm not going anywhere. I'm here in the city. So if you need to talk about the class, let me know your availability and we can set that up as well. Um, not to say that that's a requirement, but I just want to offer that as another opportunity to talk if you want, if you need that in regard to the class. Um, and I'll also include a link to that walking tour with the pictures of Isaac Asimov's dad's stores um, uh, on the lecture this week as well. So everybody, you know, stay well. If you get an opportunity to get a vaccine shot, take it. Keep your mask on. Maintain social distancing guidelines. Uh, be safe, take care of yourselves and your loved ones, and I will be talking to you all again real soon.